Hello, welcome to tonight's meeting of the Hand-Eye Supply Curiosity Club this evening. Uh, we are your hosts, I'm Tobias and this is Will. Tonight we have a number of curious and exciting topics to share with you. As attendees of the Hand-Eye Supply Curiosity Club, you are all now members provided you adhere to our philosophy. Ex curiositas scientia. We pledge to no learn without prejudice in pursuit of our mutual goal, perpetual noviceship. We admit that it is impossible to know everything about anything and thus we remain perpetually curious and perpetually novice. This is our flag and our mascot Franklin. Uh, the lightning bolt represents the receipt of knowledge, the enlightenment of illumination, the resonance of truths understood. It awakens and excites us and makes us hungry for more. Curiosity Club is made merrier by our fellow artisans at Fort George Brewery in Astoria, Oregon. And now let's give a warm Curiosity Club welcome to photographer William Anthony. I did it. I told you I wasn't going to do it. And I totally did it. Can everybody hear me over that? Did I kill it? There we go. That was tonight's only mistake. <laughs> Thankfully, we're surrounded by lots of wood. Well, thank you all for coming out. Really appreciate it. Uh, the reason that mistake happened is because I wanted to put some toys out here for everyone to take a look at at some point. Uh, very professional debut here. All right. Once again, thanks for coming out. I really appreciate you all being here. This project has kind of taken over my life. Oh gosh, the last couple of months, I believe. Hopefully this chair won't make too much noise. Um, but mostly I wanted to come here tonight to talk to everybody about how personal projects can really motivate and how going back to fundamentals is uh, something that I think is really important to all creatives, no matter what your uh, endeavor is. Mine, obviously, is photography. So um, also, I've discovered a wonderful community of people down at uh, the Portland International Raceway, something I did not know previously. Um, <clears throat> and it has, without hyperbole, kind of changed me as a person. So hopefully tonight, after seeing some of these images and hearing some of the stories, you'll feel the same way. Um, the name of the project is Time Slip, and that'll hopefully make a little bit more sense as time goes on during the talk tonight. Um, a time slip at a drag strip is the small little receipt of paper that the driver receives after each run. And after photographing uh, images, gosh, probably after two weeks in a row, I began to realize there was a timelessness to that environment there, that as I was at the racetrack, I noticed that things just started to kind of feel differently and uh, it could have been the 70s or 80s and in some cases some of the people that have been racing down there have been racing there 30, 40 years. So timelessness is definitely a theme. A couple things I want to get uh, out of the way right off the bat. Uh, first and foremost is I don't hate digital. There seems to be this really strange um, battle between people who are evangelizing for digital photography and the other end of the spectrum, which are people evangelizing for analog film, old methods, whatnot. Um, I use both. It's been part of my life for the past 20 plus years. Started with film, migrated over to digital, and they both have a place in this world. I'm really glad that film is making a resurgence. I didn't want it to see, I didn't want to see it disappear forever. Uh, but I just want to be clear, I am not, I believe in megapixels and grain. Uh, second of all, I am not a car expert. Um, I'm a car buff. I think there's a shared interest in cars and vehicles and we've all ridden in them. So uh, baseline, everybody kind of has an understanding of cars. But if you have very specific questions about piston compression ratios, uh, I'll have a special guest later on at the Q&A that can answer those questions for you. It's not me. Uh, the beauty of that, along the lines of uh, Curiosity Club, is I consider myself a perpetual amateur. And being out at the racetrack, I don't know much, but I'm learning every single day. And along those lines, tonight's talk is going to be half photo and half moto. So uh, 
next comes the obligatory uh, you know, question, the show of hands. How many people here are into the photography end of things? Guessing most people. How many are into the cars? All right, good, nice and even. Um, quick question for our AV. I'm not seeing my notes up here. No. Just seeing the slides. Technical difficulties, folks. Hang on one sec. Is it this here? Oh, there we go. Yay. Thanks. You'll just edit that out, right? That's one good thing about digital. All right, so let me back up a bit. So background, just a little bit about me so you know where I'm coming from. Uh, former ad guy, like a lot of people in this town. I was an art director for about just under 10 years before I picked up a camera. Uh, I've been shooting for about 12 years now professionally. Um, and I've lived on every major city here on the West Coast except San Francisco which I can't afford now. But I've been in and around Portland for about 20 plus years, so I consider myself an honorary Oregonian. When I first started my career, it was with music. Uh, I was the first volunteer photographer at KEXP in Seattle, the radio station, and I was very fortunate to have the time I had there uh, photographing uh, bands coming and going. It became my, my lab of sorts. I kind of learned how to cut my teeth in some very difficult circumstances, but a lot of fun steady stream of subject matter coming in front of me. Uh, early and mid 2000s, I moved over into uh, motorcycles. I had a friend who uh, did some painting on motorcycles and asked me if I would get some photographs of some of his pieces. And that slowly turned into you know, really cool bikes like this one at Lucky's Choppers, which uh, Lucky's Choppers is now a bar in Seattle, sadly, all the way up to these ridiculous things. Uh, you remember back in those days when you'd turn on the television and watch a father and his son argue all night about building motorcycles? That was that genre there. The other, the other thing I did a lot of at the time was aviation photography. I have several family members in aviation and uh, I was a volunteer photographer at the Museum of Flight in Seattle for uh, probably about three years. Great access, wonderful opportunities to photograph really cool stuff. Obviously, these are the Blue Angels. Uh, a lot of those images look a lot the same. I wanted to kind of give a different perspective on that. Um, and then there's all sorts of fun things that you get to do when you're an aviation photographer, like flying the backseat of old warbirds. This will come in a little bit later. Um, the experience of shooting aircraft really came into play when it came to photographing dragsters, and I'll tell you a little bit about that later. Editorial work. Um, I really want to show who people are, and not just what they look like. So anytime I can get an environmental portrait of someone or really let, I just try to get out of the way when there's someone like Michael Maker. Um, but likewise, if somebody's maybe a little bit more shy and reserved, it's my job to sort of bring them out. Commercial work, uh, this company is called uh, Illumigear. They make a, a LED safety light for construction and road workers. That was a lot of fun. That is all in camera, by the way, on the bottom. There's no Photoshop there. We were actually on a freeway in the middle of the night. And then most recent work is uh, some Starbucks lifestyle work I've been doing in the last year or so. That's a lot of fun. And uh, also went to Africa in Zambia for a solar panel startup company, Microsoft. Can't shoot in Seattle without shooting for Microsoft at some point. But this was a lot of fun. It was more of that docu lifestyle work, which again, not just showing you my portfolio, uh, all of this over the years has contributed to the work at the drag strip in one way or another. And um, this work for the North Face with ultra runners also really sort of drove that point home. I was chasing down these crazy people. Uh, you want to talk about a subculture, you know, just in this um, layout here, I mean, guy on the upper left, you know, getting fluids after a 100 mile race. Frame on the right is food, salt, you know, hydration. And anybody know what they use? The other stuff for? And just dab that in there to keep everything lubed up. Uh, and the guy on the bottom left won the race. And he was delusional. Couldn't say his own name. <laughs> and yes, the bottom right, he did completely ralph up everything that he ate seconds after I took that photo. So story's there if you're looking for it. And more importantly, if you're prepared for it. These things don't wait for you. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about personal projects, once again, kind of leading into the dragsters. Uh, art photographers, oftentimes, the whole basis of their work is their personal perspective. 
I'm an assignment photographer. I'm a commercial and editorial photographer. So oftentimes I'm shooting somebody else's vision, not my own personally. But um, the personal project is the opportunity for the commercial photographer, the editorial photographer, to then sort of pursue their own muse, whatever that may be. And sometimes there's something really close to your heart. But for me, having ADHD and a lot of curiosity, I tend to want to find new experiences. Every time that phone rings, I know there's something I've never done or seen before. And I really, really look forward to those phone calls. This was a series that I did uh, at the Oregon Historical Society's uh, vault, where they store all of their um, uh, artifacts. These are all um, mannequins from the Myron Frank collection. You guys familiar with Myron Frank, old school Portland people? Um, when they closed down, they donated all of their mannequins to uh, the Oregon, Oregon Historical Society. And as you walk through the vault, you see all the different eras. And I wanted to photograph them not as objects, but as people. And then my most recent personal project was with the LeMay Car Museum. And this is where I start to kind of inch towards the automotive world. Um, the LeMay Automotive Museum is that silver bread loaf looking building next to the uh, Tacoma Dome. They have the largest uh, collection of cars in the United States, I believe, or West Coast, second only to Jay Leno. And in this particular project, we decided to boost their social media presence. Uh, I came up with the idea of photographing as many of the cars as I could find that had faces. And on social media, there's a hashtag, I see faces. So I wanted to, the, the museum wanted to get more than just the car buffs. They wanted to get the moms and the kids and the families in. And talking about compression ratios, don't get that. So I figured, well, it worked for Pixar. Let's give it a go. And we shot these with a special wide angle lens and lighting to really accentuate the faces of the cars. And this got picked up by Popular Mechanics and Jalopnik and ultimately CNN.com, which brought all sorts of return back to the museum. And while a lot of people want to know what each car was, I like to give them characters. And to me, this was the nerd. Really fun. Uh, the dark room. Moving on here, um, I first got into the darkroom in 1998. Took a Photo 100 class completely as an elective. I wanted to get into advertising and design. I was using my then girlfriend's camera. I honestly had no intention of even buying a camera. First day in the safe light, I fell completely in love with the darkroom. And my first roll of film that was one subject matter, not just random pictures of my friends and cats, uh, which is what I do now on Instagram, um, was uh, Woody cars in Encinitas, California. And I spent the entire day running around taking pictures of these cars and found out that cars make great subjects when you're practicing because they don't move. And they're very pretty and they have an inherent uh, sort of beauty to them. I built this dark room and after about eight years of being the art director that brought his camera on set, um, I tore it all down and put it in storage for eight years. This photograph changed my life. I had been shooting with digital and strobes and lamenting the fact that I didn't have a lot of equipment. And uh, I read Helmut Newton's autobiography. Very famous, if you don't know, very famous fashion photographer. That's his kit. That's it. He says right there in the text, if he needed a studio or other gear, he'd rent it. But by and large, that's it. And I remember thinking to myself, I love Helmut Newton. If he can do what he does with this, it just opened doors to me. I mean, who wouldn't want to be this guy? I mean, come on. He looks happy. I think he died crashing into the Mondrian Hotel, I think. I mean, that's a lot of respect for him. The next thing that sort of changed things for me was buying this camera. Uh, I averted the Leica cult for a long, long time um, until I got my hands on this camera and just fell in love with it. There's reasons why Leicas are so coveted. And I'd shot with many other cameras. This black Canon 8E1 was my first camera that I ever owned. And this is my most recent camera. And um, buying that Leica M3, which has no internal light meter, really sort of honed the blade again. I'd gotten so used to just spraying and praying and shooting digital and bringing it into Lightroom and those sorts of things that when the opportunity came up to go back to film, I did it and bought this camera and decided to uh, shoot it as much as I could, but then realized film's really expensive. <laughs> so uh, called my brother who was storing my 
my darkroom equipment. He shipped it all back from Phoenix, and I rebuilt the darkroom. And the first place I took the camera to give it a go was a car show, thanks to Jim Golden, my colleague here today. Uh, the beach is cruising. If you're not familiar with it, it's up at Portland International Raceway every Wednesday in the summer, and it's a huge, beautiful car show. You could spend hours wandering around taking pictures. I took the camera there and just started shooting as much as I could, all black and white. I deliberately wanted to shoot black and white again, just to kind of get back to the fundamentals. And the subject matter is, you know, it's an embarrassment of riches. There's plenty to shoot. But little by little, I started to notice that I was really enjoying not so much shooting the cars, but how they're personalized by their owners and drivers. The deeper story to me was really starting to affect me. You know, my tagline, quote unquote, is true story. And I like that a lot. Uh, true story is either what somebody says at the end of an unbelievable story. No, no, true story. Uh, or it can mean true story. So you get rid of all of the, the fat and go right to the meat. And I felt like I was starting to get to that. And the more I saw, the more I had questions, and the more I wanted to talk to people and not just take pictures of cars. The human interactions with the vehicle speaks about so much more than just automotive. And then I found the, the pits. I'd heard off to the side, I heard all these cars taken off, and you can't ignore it. And like a moth to the flame, I just started leading my way over to the, to the drag strip. And you see these cars, and I think the 10-year-old boy in me was excited. The adult in me was excited. Uh, it was pretty cool. But then I also noticed that you know, a photo of a badass car is nice, but a same photo of that car with the human completes the story. And it also makes you curious. I looked at this photo and I thought, who is that guy and what are they looking at? You know, what's that thing around his neck? And his trailer it says, I think it says carpentry, TH carpentry. So this guy's not a professional drag racer. You know, he's, this is his weekend thing. I started walking around the staging lanes, which we'll talk about a little bit later, and noticed that there was also this inherent drama of ritual. Drivers getting ready for the race, suiting up and getting into their, their zone. And also I started noticing a multi-generational aspect to it. Grandpas helping out the grandkids, firing up the little mini dragsters, and the moms putting on the safety harnesses. I was seeing familial bonds being reinforced, and you know, I said grandparents and grandkids working together and doing everything by hand, which is getting rarer and rarer these days. And in some cases, even just seeing a person with no car became interesting to me. I began watching the watchers and wanting to be that fly on the wall and photograph them. Another thing that's interesting about NHRA, the National Hot Rod Association, is they believe in an open pit policy, which means you can walk up to anything practically within safety. Um, this photo was taken from the public area. They have these weird little bar stools set up and you just get coated in rubber smoke. It's really cool. And if that car kicks to the left, you might get flecks of rubber in your face. Fire beware. It was at the end of this day that I really thought this could be a series. So I went back immediately and began drawing up my dark room again and putting it together piece by piece so that I could have no financial restrictions on this project. I also decided to narrow down the cameras I was using. I'm so used to having a litany of gear, either my own or rented, that the idea of having constraints really appealed to me. Not unlike uh, you know, a chef on Top Chef being given three ingredients and having to make a four-star meal out of it. Um, so these two cameras are what I started with. My Canon AE-1 with a uh, 28 millimeter f2.8 for wide angle over one shoulder and the Leica with a 51.5 over the other shoulder so I could get a little bit closer, but not too close. Robert Kappa said, your photos aren't good enough, you're not close enough. And I agree with that in this particular instance. I also believe very strongly in the fact that it's not about gear. I like to talk to students and new photographers and try to get them away from thinking so much about gear. And the reason for that is that, you know, nobody ever told Hemingway he must have had a great typewriter. Nobody read his prose and thought, wow, what kind of ribbon are you using? In my mind, it's not about the gear. It's not what's in your hands, it's what's in your head. That's gonna dictate your story and your perspective. And that's my kit every Wednesday night. And even that seems like a lot to me. A Couple of prints to hand out to drivers to make friends. Uh, field notes, 
because I have a terrible long-term memory. If somebody told me their name, I'd have to write it down immediately. And of course, an extra battery for the phone. And then lastly, I brought on the Roloflex, the most recent week that I had, because I decided I really wanted to get some portraits of these wonderful people. And I just love the square format and the additional grain that you get with that. Also, the out-of-focus areas on that lens are sublime. Moving on to PIR, Portland International Raceway. Originally, it was the city of Vanport. And there's a lot of history that you can read up on Vanport. Uh, but the short story is that in 1942, it was built by uh, Henry Kaiser uh, to house shipyard workers. And ultimately, I believe in the 60s, 1960, no, we have an expert here. I'll ask him in the Q&A, but uh, it flooded completely. And in 1960, the city of Portland purchased it. And around 1961-ish time, the abandoned roads started to get used as racetracks. And little by little, it became... Portland International Raceway. It's just a Google Maps. I'm going to show you the different parts of this. I figured the best way to do this. I'm allowed three, right? <laughs> um, the best way to tell the story is to kind of talk about the path of the drivers and the way they actually function. So the first one are the pits. And again, NHRA, NHRA rules are open pits. So you can walk up to those areas uh, as a spectator if you like. They're located right there on the bottom right. My cat hates me because I took the toy, but there we go. Uh, those are the pits right there. You enter from up here, you come around this way. So if you're going to the beaches cruising, which is in this big grass meadow, you cannot miss the pits. And if you walk from the parking lot, you can actually walk through the pits. And I, I highly encourage anybody that's interested in this to go down there and do it. It's really cool. Um, yeah, first roll, first shot of the roll, that's why the left-hand side of the frames, but I don't care. I think it looks cool. But that's what the pits look like first thing in the day. No cars, no trailers, no nothing. I just love those trash cans. Check, even the, you're even a winner when you're throwing your trash out. Now, the great thing about the pits is the ability to mingle, to meet and greet, talk to people. The open pit policy means you can walk up to a car and go, what's that? And nine times out of 10, the person will tell you about what that is, or they'll tell you to leave them alone and then you find someone else. Unloading, it's just fun to watch that ritual and these people are so used to doing it, one by one. Uh, Greg here, who's here this evening, he uh, pulls up uh, Oldsmobile station wagon, right? With his open trailer and unloads his Oldsmobile dragster. He'll prop the back ends of the vehicles up, do engine tests, tune, spin the back wheels. In some cases, there's people that literally drive their cars in on street tires, lift them up, put their drag racing slicks on, race. At the end of the night, they put their normal street tires back on and go home. Really cool. The Super Pro cars uh, at Portland International Raceway, they don't have top fuel like you see on TV with the big, huge engines and alcohol top fuel burners. But Super Pro does have alcohol burning cars. Um, they're still very impressive. And I have a video to show you guys shortly that will give you an idea of what I'm talking about. But it's a more leisurely pace. It's really fun to just kind of wander around, again, with just two cameras over my shoulders. Uh, this audience also really appreciated the analog cameras, something I didn't expect. But if you think about this audience, this group of people, they're wrench turners. They like physical things. And so there's plenty of photographers that show up with digital cameras. And I show up with these two cameras, and I can't show them any pictures. So guess what? I talk. We talk to each other, we get to know each other. Every now and then the camera goes up, take a picture, and the camera goes away. A lot less intimidating. And there's just a beauty to it. I got lucky the first week, those clouds were there. The rest of it was all blue skies, which, eh, to a photographer, not the best. Again, the personalization that you see on the cars, all those little stickers are wins. Um, American flag, quite prominent, NHRA, uh, Wednesday nights, a lot of American muscle cars. Friday and Saturday nights are when it's an open public race, and you, that's where you get a lot of Japanese cars and lower cars and front-wheel drive cars. But Wednesday nights, it's rock and roll. <laughs> Another thing I wanted to talk about was why black and white. First of all, it's cheaper, <laughs> to be honest. But second of all, creatively, these cars, I mean, you look at them, and they're just rainbows of color. Metal, fleck paint, um, metal flake paint and sponsor stickers, 
I didn't want viewers to fixate on a particular customization. I wanted this series to be about racing. And then you look for other types of customizations. These little numbers they put on the side of their car to indicate which racers who. I love that they changed that to cool, because they are. The Dietrich family, a trucking family from uh, Washington, Vancouver, Washington, these are the grandparents. And the grandparents don't race, uh, but the parents race and their two sons race. And actually, yeah, their kids and their grandkids all race. There's more of them coming up. Mike Nichols, he's uh, very quiet, still waters run deep. I've yet to crack his shell, but uh, he has a mean car and uh, oftentimes he's the guy to beat. Sometimes I felt like a cultural anthropologist coming into this group of people, not knowing who anybody is and having to slowly, little by little, ingratiate myself to them. It takes time, really important. This is the sort of thing, I wanted this to be a long story, but I observed and asked a lot of questions. Eventually they came to trust me. Most of them just shrugged me off, but the other amber, you also see where money goes. It's a beautiful Ford. I don't know if you can see the license plate frame, but it says you're looking at a winner. And I love that license plate the best. Can you read it? <laughs> Montana plates that say cop bait. And I couldn't help but get a couple of faces in there. It was still in me. I also really, really love the sort of DIY attitude on some of the racers. Uh, this is Don Vandehe's truck. He's been racing motorcycles out there for, gosh, 30 years plus, maybe. Um, more about him later. He's one of my favorite people out there. And we don't talk much, but just watching him is fun. Uh, this is a super pro dragster. Big, huge tires, airfoil to keep that back end down. But interestingly enough, PIR is only an eighth of a, eighth of a mile drag strip. Typically NHRA used to be a quarter mile, but they've just shortened it. So they don't use their parachutes at PIR. Um, but these cars would if they kept going on the gas. Also plenty of interesting fans. And then also I just love the sort of personalization that you see at the racetrack. And the sleeping giants waiting to get out of their trailers. It does kind of feel like, you know, horses in the, in the starting gate. It just looks odd in there. <laughs> All tied down and trying to get out. Uh, this is, uh, Ed Peters, who's here tonight, he'll be coming up and answering questions if you guys have any eventually, but uh, that's from inside of his trailer and him fueling up the car. They just put enough fuel in the cars for the, for the run and to get back. And you see the, the juniors. Some of them have super nice, beautiful trailers, and this guy literally just has the dragster hanging out of the, the tailgate. The dials, air gauges, I just, I mean, there's just an embarrassment of riches like I'd mentioned. The inside of the cars, everybody personalizes those differently as well. The brackets, it's all bracket racing. Races start uh, about five o'clock. Everybody gets a couple of runs and then elimination start around 7 p.m. That's Tony. I met him on my first week and he hasn't been back since, but I'd love to shoot him again. Mike, he uh, races the only Harley. Those stickers on the back are wins. So it's a bit like the Red Baron's X's on the side of his plane. And that's Don. I just want to take a moment here to talk about Don. He's kind of the grandpa uh, motorcycle racer out there. He's one of the nicest people out there. Drives this beater truck with two old motorcycles on the back. Uh, last time I was there, he's walking around with a bag of apples that he picked from his orchard, handing them out to other racers. Um, that bike is called the Phoenix. Um, it bur his garage burned to the ground, um, and he was, I believe, left with, you know, the basic parts of this motorcycle, and he rebuilt it from the ground up, and he calls it the Phoenix. And he refuels it from a paint thinner can, which I think is great. <laughs> I need to get the job done. Uh, this is Bill Hurd's Pinto. You'll be seeing a little bit more of that in a little bit. Safety first. I mean, you look in these cars, and you realize it's a Pinto on the outside. It's a Gemini space capsule on the inside. <laughs> You see cars coming out half naked. You really get a chance to see them. Every now and then they'll scowl at you when you take their picture. But again, it's open pits. People come up, they chat, they talk. Kids want to see what's going on. 
Race it, break it, fix it, repeat. And once again, there's Ed getting ready for a run. I love Mike. He hops in there in his shorts and a t-shirt and he drives to the staging lanes and then he puts on his Nomex suit. Bob Newman suiting up, super pro. There's women racers, lots of women racing, as evidenced by certain parts of trailers. You get all types. And again, we'll do a QA and a at the end, so if anybody has any specific questions, just hold off and we'll do it at the end because I'm going to get through the photos. Uh, another junior class driver. Sometimes they drive them all the way back, sometimes they get towed. Fashion sense, can't say. <laughs> is the greatest, but uh, there are rules about having to wear long pants, so sometimes guys will cheat and wear pajama pants, which I think is kind of funny. Oops, where you saw that one. And then lastly, I love this t-shirt. It really encapsulates a lot, encapsulate a lot of what's going on out there. So the next area are the staging lanes, and those are located basically just to the side of the pits, and that's, as the name implies, where people stage for the race. This was a really good opportunity for me to kind of wander around and sort of mingle into the parade and take a look at cars, chat with drivers, watch the rituals, but also you start to see that focus and the concentration. Um, I was told by one racer that when people are in their cars, leave them alone. If their door's open, they'll chat, but if the door's closed, they're getting into the zone, leave them alone, and I respected that. But again, it's another opportunity to see the cars up close and see how they're customized. And the crew chief, she's at every race with uh, her husband. That's Linda Statham. She also drives. I haven't seen her race, but. Uh, and then this uh, was Greg hazing me. <laughs> I was standing at the end of the row, and he came up to me and just, I'm like, oh, yeah, you want to play chicken? All right. So I got down on one knee, and he came right up, to, mm -hmm, came right up to me and stopped. He got out of the car and he went, brakes work. <laughs> and uh, he always wears a straw hat. Uh, and right before he races, he takes the straw hat off and puts it on the ground and then puts his helmet on, which I think is great. And uh, there's Greg again, the only Oldsmobile out there. It's a big car. It's impressive. But as you can see, and I'll just go through these shots, that uh, it's a really good opportunity because they're not moving yet. <laughs> Once they start moving, it gets tricky. This is Mike again. I have to go back one frame. He drives a pretty badass dragster. And I just think it's hilarious that in between races, he's zipping around in a tank top on this little scooter. I don't know if you can see on here, but I, I focused in on his wedding ring. I don't know why. It just drew me. There are humans in there, you know? getting ready for another run. This is a close-up shot of one of the dragster's slicks. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about those later. They're very, very customized, unique tires, different than just about any others. But if you do go out, I suggest wandering around the staging lanes. It's the closest you're going to get to those cars as they're running, getting ready for a race. These are the Dietrich boys. I don't even think they're old enough to drink, but uh, they drive some pretty fast cars, and they're pretty competitive guys. Charlie, I think he's about 20, but he drives a super pro dragster, and that's him sans helmet and with the helmet. I just love that shot. Once again, I think that's, you're talking about that concentration. And Tyler suiting up in his Ford, which is one of the weirder looking cars, but it's pretty neat. And that's his father in the back. They typically carry a uh, pressure gauge, check tire pressures. And there's the two Dietrichs. Greg, the guy that hazed me, he has an old school roll cage, pull, gets in the car, pulls the bar up, and then sticks a pin in. Another junior dragster. They're, they don't have starters, I believe, so they use these battery-powered manual starters before every run. And so typically you'll see a parent with the car kind of going alongside them. And this little girl looked just like Little Miss, Sun, little Miss Sunshine. She looks like about nine years old. It was just great. It was awesome. She gets in this car, fires it up, and takes off. Bill Hurd, he's the legend. Um, he and another driver whose name escapes me at the moment, uh, they used to race at Vanport when it was Vanport, when they were in their teens. He's been racing there ever since. 
He's also known as a legend because in Idaho, he did a wheel stand. You can see it on YouTube. It's insane. They did a contest where they got rid of the, the bar in the back that keeps them from flipping over. And he, just look it up. It's insane. The other nice thing about the staging lanes is the ability to sort of start to see the art of the cars. It's a battery switch. Uh, NHRA rules dictate that if the car flips over, God forbid, or there's an accident, the uh, safety crew needs to be able to come up and shut everything off with one switch. So you'll see that somewhere on the exterior of the car. Again, more personalization. Just the beauty of it. There's also a lot of motorcycle racers. They tend to stage, not so much in the lanes, but they stage kind of in this other pit area in the back. There's Don, just about ready to go. And that's Don getting into the zone. I don't bother him at that point. And that's the other thing. When I'm out there shooting, I try not to, I mean, I want to get close, but I don't want to get in their faces or be distracting. So oftentimes I just kneel down and uh, wait for the moment. And if they look over, they look away. It's just, boop, click, gone. That's it. And then these cameras are very quiet. Not too much of a distraction. But that's what the Leica, just catching that. The, the sun typically sets right at the end of the drag strip. So for, a, for the drivers, it's hell, because they're looking right into the sun. But for me, it's glorious, because you get wonderful light like this. And uh, <laughs> that's Jack. He's very quiet. Um, he runs the staging lanes. He's got a headphones on, and he basically says who goes next and when. You can't miss him. Kind of walks around him. This is the last shot of the staging lanes. And I just love this one, just because it was at the end of the day. Uh, it was towards the last rounds of racing, and just a couple guys shooting the breeze, doing what they love. The next area has no official name, so I'm just going to call it the left turn. And that is from the staging lanes to the burnout boxes. This is kind of my danger zone. Um, there's usually two gentlemen at the burnout boxes. That's Gary. There's also Rooster. I don't know what his name is. He's just Rooster. Um, and all the cars make a left turn from the staging lanes to the burnout box. Remember I said before that I shot aviation a while back? That really comes in handy because these drivers are driving very, very large customized cars with helmets on, and they can't see anything but this. So when I would be out on the tarmac photographing you know, old warbirds, a lot of times they were tail draggers, so they couldn't even see in front of them. So it's my responsibility not to get run over or get my head cut off. And the same rules apply at the drag race. These guys are thinking about their times, they're thinking about the cars and their fuel and their tire pressures. I don't want to worry about them. So I got to keep my head on straight. So I don't get run over. It can be really challenging at that point, uh, but also beautiful. Later on in the day, I could run up to my uh, standard pressure with uh, the two top press valves. And likewise, um, this shot is super important. because uh, after the sun set and all the tire smoke started to billow out the back, those floodlights light up the smoke. I haven't gotten this gentleman's name yet, but he drives. He's a racer. He comes out and watches the races. Again, it's a work in progress. I hope to keep going back and answer some of these questions. So it takes time, though. Here's Jack again. The other thing that's, another analogy I like to say is that these drag races are a lot like an aircraft carrier. It's the same sort of motion of danger and movement and not unlike an aircraft carrier, vehicle stage, they come up to the catapult and they get launched. This is a, a racer and his son who also races. And uh, right after that, the racer opens his door and they give each other a fist bump. And then again, just another panning shot. The drag bikes either have those long booms that stick out the back to keep them from flipping over, or they're stretched like these. And uh, they're pretty impressive. Like I said, the next one is the burnout box, which this is where all the excitement starts. Everybody loves the burnout box. The purpose of a burnout box is to heat the tires up. The two guys that run the burnout box have hoses and brooms and a bucket of water. And what they do is they try to maintain a clean puddle of water so the racers can drive through, wet their tires, and then do a burnout, which uh, makes them stickier. I love the pageantry of that shot. And there's a super pro 
And the idea being is that these cars are, have so much torque and they're so powerful that if they were to hit the gas, the, the wheels would just spin. So the best way to avoid that is they heat the tires up, they get them nice and sticky, and they also cover, and I'll touch on this a little bit later, they cover the starting line with uh, stuff called track bite. It's like pine tar on a baseball bat. When you walk on this stuff, it'll pull a sole off your shoe if it's not well glued. Motorcycles will come. This guy's, I don't know his name, but can you see his right foot? <laughs> he really gets into it. He kind of does this little, he's trying to get the whole slick heated. And he's the only one that does that, which looks kind of cool. But that's the public area. You can sit there. I, you know, I hated the smell at first. Now I miss it. That's how close you can get. So we'll typically do a burnout. If you watch top field dragsters, they go, you know, quite a distance down and then they slowly back up. Here it's usually just kind of a quick burnout. I'll have a video of that shortly. I love this old beater truck too. But I think you get the basic idea here. That's a good shot of the puddle. Some motorcyclists avoid it. They don't want to get both tires wet. But uh, again, this is what reminds me a lot of an aircraft carrier, the two catapults. And you can see the two burnout box keepers, Gary and Rooster, with their buckets. And it's important that they keep those areas clean because when those tires spin, I, I made the mistake once, and you usually only make it once, of standing directly behind one. And I had my camera in front of my face, but I felt all these flecks of rubber and uh, hopefully no asphalt. But their job is to keep it clean. And they'll basically hold the two cars until the cars at the starting line go. And then the starter, Jim, will give the Gary and Rooster a, a signal, and they'll say hold, and then when it's time for them to do a burnout, like baseball umpires, they can be a little animated with their, what they do, which is great for photography. Um, and then uh, move into place, and then he's go. They do their burnout. And it's just constant maintenance, and like an aircraft carrier, they're looking for foreign objects on the ground, make sure there's nothing there, like a bolt or a nut. Uh, or stones, glass, anything. They're also safety officers. They're always looking out at the cars to make sure doors are locked or doors are closed. Uh, there's no loose bolts or stuff hanging off the cars. The other nice thing about being able to get that close, and truthfully, even before I had media credentials, I could just walk up and get close to the cars, which really surprised me. But what was nice about it was I started again to kind of go away from the tires and towards the faces. It was really neat to see how they do what they do on the faces they're making while they do it. Bill Hurd's car, the Pinto, in form only. Many people have offered to buy that car, I guess, but he won't sell it. Some guys smoke more than others. <laughs> Some of them smoke a lot. And then typically from this point, they slowly move up towards the uh, starting line. And then this next series here is just a series of close-ups that sort of tell the burnout, all these different types of cars. And every now and then they get a little squirrely, like Greg's car. <laughs> Here's Linda again. This is actually a series of three photos, but I only included the one. She checked the tire pressures, and then she just turned around and put her head down, and he did the burnout behind her. And that's the last one. So moving on from there, we're going to the starting line. I won't get into the weeds about what ET drag racing is, elapsed time. It's pretty complicated. It's not, what you, it's not a matter of whoever gets off the front wins. In some cases, there's computers controlling the cars or their starts and they estimate their time, the idea being that they'll finish roughly at the same time. Um, basically, any two cars can be paired with each other using that system. And really what it ends up being is a race between who reacts quickest off the line. That's as far as I can go. <laughs> we'll talk to racers about that a little bit later, but starting line obviously is just past the burnout boxes. And this is another real dangerous place, but here you see uh, Pete, who runs the drags, putting down that sticky material. 
I don't know if you can see real well there, but it's thick. It really is. I mean, you could take a spoon and scoop up this, you know, peel it off the ground. You also have to maintain uh, any divots, kind of like golf. You know, you get a big chunk out of it, you got to go in and clean it up. Or if a car is leaking fluid, you don't want anything slippery on that section. So he'll come out and clean that up. There's two super pros. I call this one the composer, because typically what he'll do is when uh, they're done doing a burnout, he gives them the go ahead to go to the starting line. Jim's a great guy. I've gotten to know him pretty well from the group, because when you're hanging out, you have to get permission to go into that starter's box. It's protected by basically guardrails like you'd see on the freeway. And uh, you spend any time there, you just start chatting with him. Turns out he's an old film photographer. He's got a Pentax camera. He's thinking about bringing it out to the track since I've been out there. Uh, he's been working the track for 20 years, I think, 20 plus years, except for last year. He uh, was fighting cancer and he beat it. So God bless him. He's out there doing what he loves. I gave him a print of that shot. He was pretty happy about it. But here at the starting line, you start to see the families again. The parents typically will come out. They'll do a little mini burnout and then they move them back into place. These cars are really loud. I thought, eh, they're just the little ones, but they have no mufflers on them, and I believe they're just like little two-stroke engines, and they just want to take your eardrum and tear it like a piece of paper. And you'll see, <laughs> she does it every time. She comes out of the car, and then she goes, which I think is great. Jim does the last safety check. I've seen him on a couple of times, check doors. Just love that. You know, it's been out there a long time. It's covered in track bite. Father with his daughter. I don't know if you can see her there, but she's focusing on the track. Gives him a thumbs up, and then he gets a fist bump. Another fist bump. And these parents, every single time their kid goes down the track, they're arm in arm. I just think it's great. And this guy's watching his buddy. Again, being at the starting line also gets me with that Leica, the 50 millimeter lens, not terribly far, it's not a telephoto lens, but I can get up real close to the cars and start to see their faces. This was during what they call a sunset break. When the sun gets to that one spot where they can't see, they hold the race and they wait about 10 or 15 minutes. And then when the sun's not right in their face, they keep going. So this gentleman was just sitting waiting for it in the rock and roll Camaro. Charlie Dietrich getting ready to go in his. Now this next one is uh, the only Harley out there. And I don't know if you can see or not. He's going to be in the video coming up shortly, and you'll hear it. But can you see the vapor coming out of the uh, carburetor? He's dumping so much fuel into that car, or into that car, into that motorcycle, that it's not, he's not burning everything. So it shoots out the side. And because the sun's coming right down the track, it lit up. It was beautiful. And then he hits the gas and takes off. And his is, it's the only bike where he's literally laying down and he puts his feet on pegs way in the back. It's old school and I really dig it. And then they go, that's what they call the tree or the Christmas tree. You get amber lights, they nudge their way up until the lights go into another sequence. Again, we'll talk more about this in detail later. Um, but their reaction time, if they get a red light, it's a fault, it's a green light, they're good. This is a wrinkle wall tire. And as the name implies, so the tires grab and bite, they're typically slightly underinflated. Um, this is with the Leica. Now, I can't tell you how many times I wish I had been out there with my Canon kit. Uh, the fastest this goes is a thousandth of a second. So that's a thousandth of a second, and that's hard to catch. But the other advantage of a rangefinder is I can keep my other eye open and I can actually watch the tree with one eye and then come back over to the car when they go. And that's how I landed that. And then it became kind of a series. <laughs> and here you can also see the beadlock so the tire doesn't spin on the rim. There's bolts going into the tire to keep it in place. And on some of the newer cars, uh, they actually have a, an actual beadlock ring Catching the action on an old camera is not impossible, but it does require a lot of forethought and planning, more so than anything else. You don't accidentally get shots like these. You've got to be prepared for them. And here's our first little video 
this is Mike Nichols, and I include this, even though it's not a black and white photo from the series, to give you an idea of how fast they get out of frame, how quickly they get off the start. So, you ready for this volume-wise? I don't know if it's going to be loud, but... starts. This is a thousandth of a second after he crossed the beam. And on this shot here, I don't know if you can see, but we got four wrinkled tires and four airborne tires. That's the jump. It's so fun. I, I mean, I can't express to you how much fun it is to be that close to this. These are two super pros. I'm saying that right, right? Super pros? Okay. Perpetual novice. I love the taxi. There's another wheel stand. This brings me to the next thing I want to talk about, which are the limitations of these cameras and how you work around them. Um, when the sun sets, I've got 400 speed film. And 400 speed film is not very fast. Digital cameras now, 25,500 and higher. I mean, these things are practically night vision goggles now. But 400, by comparison, is nothing. So I realized at a certain time of the evening, I wasn't going to be able to catch action anymore. So I worked with it a little bit and thought to myself, all right, well, let's figure out a way to get something interesting out of 400 speed. So instead of cursing motion blur, I chose to embrace it. And it really does give a different vibe to the imagery. You know, I don't know what the frame rate is of our, our eyeballs, but we see blurs too. So again, the theme for me personally on this project was sort of pushing the creative boundaries and, and returning to the analog stuff so that it slowed me down a little bit, made me think about things a little bit more. But these are just a series of what I call catalog images because I just think cars are cool looking. And you start to see the profiles of the vehicles and all the personalities. The unmistakable profile of the Mustang. There's a Camaro. There's a Ford. Another Ford. More of a funny car. And here's a Camaro, and I love this series here where you got him waiting there, crouched. And then there's the takeoff. The audience. You can be in different places. This is a little further down the track. Um, but one of the other areas is what I call Vulture's Row, which is where all the photographers hang out. And these two gentlemen here, uh, Willie and Andy, I believe. Willie and Johnny. Willie, Andy, and Johnny. Uh, these two gentlemen are brothers, and they've been coming to the track uh, for decades. Jim and Ralph. Uh, on the left, he's wearing the Hawaiian. <laughs> Ralph's a photographer and he's been going out to the track for a long, long time and he was also pivotal in sort of introducing me to people and he's a familiar face and if I was with him, I was, I was in. So then there's the finish line, there's the track, that's the eighth of a mile to the bridge, the finish line is under the bridge and then a little bit further down is the turnoff where they come off the track and this shot shows the, the, the crow's nest which is where when racers are coming around on the actual circuit, it's where the, they wave the checkered flag. And uh, I asked Pete if I could go up there. I always ask permission. In this particular case, forgiveness is not better than permission. You got to make sure that you get permission because people can get hurt. And uh, I never want to be responsible for that. But from that perspective is where you get these sorts of angles, which uh, can't be beat. It's not the official finish line, but Reed's finish line. And then you get these wonderful views down the track. So that's, you can see the bridge, that's the finish line. And just to give you an idea of how fast some of these cars are going, the Super Pros in particular, uh, so that's an eighth of a mile. And then most cars will slow down by the time they get to me and do the turnoff over the line. The Super Pro guys go the whole way. <laughs> and they just 
fly by. It's really impressive. Kind of scary, to be honest with you. Um, but you get angles like this. This is the only shot I have of the finish line because there's really no vantage point to get it from. But. And then uh, the return road is what I call that. And this is the, the path that brings you back to the pits. And if you get dramatic skies, there's nothing like it. And also, I'd climb up to the top of the bleachers. The other interesting thing about the track was I walked all the way to the end and there was nobody there. And it was completely open. I completely expected some sort of yellow jacket security guy to be like, sorry, folks, park's closed. Loose up front, should have told you. Um, but there was nobody like that. It was just wide open. And in some cases, I would ask people, hey, can I go that way? And they're like, why? Sure, go ahead. And I wandered back there because a lot of times all the interest seems to be at the starting line. But I found there was a lot more interesting things going on towards the end for different angles. And then if you shoot down the road, you get these beautiful skies. I'm trying to get through some of these because I have a lot of pictures, but hope you don't mind. <laughs> There's the Ford again. And then some more panning shots. This kind of reads speed. And this is one of the junior racers watching the race. But here, to give you an example of those junior racers and how loud they are, we, we good on sound? Okay. It's way louder than that. <laughs> And then the time shack is what I call it. There's no official name for it, but this is where they get their time slips. And this is Kathy. I call her the, uh, the time vixen. It always makes her smile. Uh, just two little receipt printers that print up each racer's time from beam to beam, and she hands it over to them. And uh, that's kind of where I came up with the name of the series, Time Slip, because that's all these guys care about, is what that number says. There's Don holding his, and then uh, Greg's on a clipboard comparing previous runs to current runs. So now I want to show you another video that I think hopefully will take you there. Um, I did this, which was a lot of fun. Decided, you know, I'd bring people with me to the race. Um, in this particular video that I'm going to play, there's two halves. There's POV and then behind the scenes. The POV part is, as it implies, it's got the GoPro on there. Uh, but also, I've spliced in the actual film shots into the video, so you can see the end result of that. But here we go. Enjoy.
getting their pictures taken. So sometimes it can be a little awkward and I just chose to embrace it. <laughs> what do you want me to do? Uh, lean on your car? <laughs> lean on your car. <laughs> Look badass. <laughs> There's Greg. He's here tonight. If you have questions about Oldsmobile, he's the guy to talk to. Uh, this young gentleman, never got his name, but he drives that Camaro. And there's legend, Bill Hurd, one of the nicest guys. Last time I was out there, I uh, saw him having his photo taken with a group of handicapped kids. It's just, it's just great. This is the other long term, Gary Erickson. This is the other gentleman that's been racing out there a long time. He and Bill Hurd used to race each other as teenagers on Cottonwood Lane, which is the drag strip. Pat Fagini and his amazing, gorgeous 69 Mustang. And there's Willie sitting in Vulture's Row with his brother, Andy. Mark, his granddaughter, races uh, in the junior class. I walked up to him and I said, oh, is your, your daughter racing too? He said, granddaughter. <laughs> he was so proud to tell me that. He is a huge, huge man, very tall. And I got this guy's name briefly, but I can't remember it. I just love this photo. I mean, other than the back wheel, this could be any era, you name it. Ken Green, he's in the sportsman class. Just, that's in the uh, staging lanes waiting. Didn't get his name either, but I love his truck. And he's wearing a wife beater with it. I mean, come on, this is perfect. <laughs> Sanford and son. Greg Hereford, he's the grandpa. His two sons and his grandson are every week, out there just about every week racing together. Anthony, made friends with him. He's EMS. They typically were at the, at the beginning of the track with, in a car with the engine running the whole time because if there's, God forbid, an accident, they can't have starter problems. So he literally sits with his headphones in, and he made a joke to me, uh, asked me what EMS stand for. Well, it was an emergency medical service. Oh, earn money sleeping. <laughs> Bob Newman, very successful home builder, does this for passion. And Brian Overturf, he drives that big monster Ford with all the stickers and plaques. And then Ralph. I asked him if he'd do that. He said yes. <laughs> so, in conclusion, obviously, the sunset shot. A couple of things I just wanted to say to people that are just getting into photography or people that need the same sort of refresher that I've had with this project. Um, you know, make, make the technology a slave to your eye. Don't become a slave to the technology. Find what equipment works for you, whether it's a Holga or a Hasselblad or whatever, GoPro, it doesn't matter. What matters is up here. You don't need a lot to do a lot. Helmut Newton, good example. Uh, another good example for simpler is better is Nirvana, I think was a much better band as a three piece. <laughs> Not to mention the fact that they started every show with new equipment because they trashed it the show before. So they wouldn't have to do encores, I found out. Uh, and I think a lot of people have made a, a, a lot about the aesthetics of film photography, and I think that's true, absolutely. There are Lightroom presets that make digital look like film, and I have no problem with that. But for me personally, it's not just about the aesthetics of film photography, but the process, both shooting, developing, all that rest. It makes it a little more precious, makes you think about it a little bit more. Um, in this box are all my contact sheets for the entire program. I suggest looking through it if you want. You can see everything. Um, and lastly, PIR is struggling. I don't like using that term, but like a lot of places, a lot of cities with gentrification and growth, there's a lot of complaints about the noise at PIR, despite it having been there a long, long time. And I understand both sides of the argument, but I think it would be a horrible shame to lose this. I like to think, you know, Ed told me once that this is their bowling night. And it's a perfect analogy for many reasons. One, because they're every week, they see the same people, they're all competitive, but not too competitive. But all you have to do is drive down Halsey and see that Hollywood Bowl is now a hardware store, which makes me really worried about places like this. And I genuinely believe that there's compromise to be found. Now, PIR has compromised a lot already. 
But if it means survival, I think it means open dialogue. And my hope is that this series of photographs will show people that it's not just a bunch of meatheads driving fast cars, that it's community, it's passion. It's not just fashion. There's a lot to be said about motorsports recently. A lot of people are getting back into it. In some cases, it seems a lot more fashion-oriented. These people could care less. So I would suggest you tell your friends, go out. Just go once. I, I see some faces in the audience that have gone out already, and I think that they've enjoyed their time out there. I suggest you do the same. Uh, so with that said, I think I did all right, about an hour. Um, I want to introduce the driver of this vehicle, Edward Peters. This is his beautiful car. The burnout, because this is the best part. Please help me welcome Edward Peters, super pro race car driver. And that said, um, if anybody has any questions uh, about photography or questions about cars, by all means. Um, do we have his microphone? Is it still back here? Yeah, it should be. I don't know what happened to it. Oh, there it is. Any questions? Yes. Yeah. Just, just, I think you said it already, but is it it's every Wednesday through the summer? Yes, every Wednesday. Uh, Greg, normally uh, March, March till about the end of October, right? Yeah, yeah. Is when any trip runs. Yeah, every Wednesday night. Is that on? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'll pull it up a little. <laughs> yes. Um, I'm curious if this slowing down, how is it going to influence moving back into the you're talking about me, right? Not him. <laughs> he never slows down. <laughs> That's bad. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it, it's kind of got me to get back more into the planning phase of photography, of thinking about images beforehand. And um, a lot of the work I had done prior to this was a lot of commercial lit work where you're more concerned about producers and stylists and casting and renting gear and lights and stands. and there's something about just the camera bag photography of walking around and, and hunting for images. You know, another thing I like to tell people is that when I'm shooting digital, I'm always looking at pictures. Whereas with this, I'm looking for pictures. Because you take the picture and that's the end. You move on to the next thing. Digital, and I'm saying, again, there's a benefit to that. I mean, there's been times where I wish I could have looked at the back of that because I missed a shot or it was underexposed. And with digital, like, oh, I'm underexposed. And you adjust and you take the shot again. Um, but with this process, it really has kind of made me let go a little bit more. I feel a little more loose, and a little more free. If I get the shot, great. If I didn't get the shot, oh well. So I think it will influence me just more on kind of a zen level than a technical level. But it's been a lot of fun. I do got to say that uh, for, for us, um, you know, um, w when we get to PIR, our, our time is very limited uh, from the time that you start racing. So you don't really have a lot of time to, to spend with a lot of folks. Um, I've been in racing for the last 25 years, so I've always made it a point to make sure that, that I spend the time that, that anybody has a question, you can come by my pits. I think you know that. Um, and, and I will stop what I'm doing and I will speak to you. So I met this guy um, <laughs> out of the there it comes. <laughs> um, it happened to be just one of those days where it's very, very hot. You're, you're sweaty. You're, maybe you don't really want to be there to, be, to begin with. It's very warm. Um, and starts asking me questions. So uh, I, I stopped exactly what I was doing, and I spent the time with him. But what I, what I found was a person that was very, very interested in, in what we do in life. And uh, nothing better, Greg for us to, to somebody to take a look at what we do. This is not uh, our living by any stretch of imagination. This is what we do for our excitement. This is what we do for, for our fun. And uh, it's not a, a cheap sport by any stretch of imagination. <laughs> Don't become uh, a photographer. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think we're pretty, pretty equal. But what a pleasure for me to meet somebody that was willing to take time out of his, his day, his schedule, to come out and learn a little bit about us. And uh, it's very, very important. 
Portland um, is, a, is a place that um, is becoming harder and harder for us to race. Um, the activities here, it's just finding that place to do it. And if this can help us in any way to, to let people know that um, we're trying as hard as we can to maintain a level to live with inside the community like everybody else, but still to do our passion, um, that's important for us. And uh, we, I, I thank him very, very much. Um, I've never been very uh, comfortable with people taking my pictures. Um, the one thing about this guy I had is, a nickel for it. Yeah, I, I, I will tell you, the one thing about this guy is, man, I'll tell you, I go home at night and he sent me some pictures of just catching you in your moment. Not, you're not paying attention to a photographer. You're not paying attention to anything but what you're doing. And to me, that is just super exciting. Super, super exciting. And I thank you very yeah, much. Yeah, my pleasure. You know, it, it, that's the thing is, I, I didn't know anybody when I walked up to this audience. And it, it really became sort of my challenge to slowly work my way into it. And that's why the, the portraits came last. Because yeah. I wasn't comfortable sticking it in someone's face. Let me get your picture. And even then I got people that were like, what are these for? Because <laughs> that's the other thing with the internet these days, is you take someone's pictures, what are you going to do with it? So it really became, I mean, Ed did an enormous um, uh, favor to me by sort of vetting me. And the more people talked to Ed and the more they got to know who I was and what the hell I was doing, the more open they were to me. But it's been fun. It's been a lot of fun. And again, come out. You can't miss his car. Nope. It's parked right next to the, the car show and it's beautiful. And, uh, I, it's, I see people literally, they walk towards the car and then they just go right to it. Yeah, and yeah. It's a and good, I, I welcome anybody. Anytime you want to come out, please stop by. Um, Mucus always going. Um, always happy to see anybody come and out. And it so. ends October? First weekend of October. First weekend of October, yeah. Um, and there's nowadays, as you can tell, there's a lot more rain outs than oh, in yeah. the summer. But yeah. come on out. It's nine bucks. And there's, there's a car show. Too. So there's yeah. a drag racing, then there's a car show, like two, three hundred cars in every era. Yep. Like 57 yeah. Chevy to like, a, you know. Pretty much anything that you would want to see really is there. And totally. if you have a car older than 1970? Yeah. 73. If you have a car that's older than 73, it's a cheaper price. And, Five bucks. Yeah, anybody in the car. Is it cheaper if you're older than 70? Yeah. <laughs> I wish. I wish. <laughs> yes, the Beaches Cruise In is a fantastic car show, even if you don't want to watch dragsters. Ed, can you talk about what your car is? Like, what's the motor? So basically, I have a, a, what they call a, an alcohol dragster. It's a two, 235 inch dragster uh, made by Uriah in Marysville, California. Uh, it has a 540 big block Chevy in it. Um, if Anywhere besides Portland, it runs about 1,100 um, horsepower. Um, Portland, I have to choke it down to make the noise level. So I'm running about 850 horsepower at Portland. And you got mufflers too, right? And I have mufflers on top of that too, because I, I, I want this to continue, and so I'll do everything I can to make sure that we, we do that. Um, if I go to a quarter mile track, it's a low six second car, about a 623, 624 uh, in the quarter mile, doing about 185 to 190, depending on, on, on the day. How, uh, how long does it take you to get to that speed? Did uh, you say about how fast to uh, top speed? 6.32 seconds is what you got. <laughs> um, drag racing is really, it's not about how fast you can go. That's the thing. That they, in bracket racing, it's about how quick you are on your button. What's your reaction time? And what I mean by that is everybody has a button on their steering wheel. And so you kind of lock into that. And once you release it, that's your reaction time. That's what's going to get you down the track. Um, I, I raced circle track for many, many, many years before I came into drag racing. And when I got into drag racing, I kind of thought to myself, eh, this is going to be easy. <laughs> There's a lot of old people. This should be fairly good. Fairly good. Fairly good. Fairly good. Well, what I realized was it was about reaction time, and the first year I was out there, I had, I have the fastest car at Portland. It's the fastest car. That doesn't mean you're going to win. So um, all these guys have pretty much handed it to me on a regular basis. Um, over the last few years, I've gotten a little bit better, uh, continue to get better. But uh, bracket racing is very challenging, and if you take the time to understand it, it's, uh, it's a pretty interesting deal. You know, it's interesting because when I'm at the starting line. I can watch these guys hitting the switch. Mm -hmm. And it's so funny because some people are, you don't notice, they just literally take their thumb off the button. Mm -hmm. But then there's other guys that are really animated oh, about yes. it. And Greg is one of them where I've oh, seen yes. him getting his Vega 
and I, I think you can see from the from the short um, POV video that you know they rev up and the car kind of itches and wants to go, and uh, when the light goes, Greg like slams the switch yeah. and then the car takes off and it's just the coolest thing in the and world. And I didn't understand that. I really it took me a long time because I, I honestly I'm a guy that just goes. <laughs> Really, uh, it's on my stern wheel. I just, I just let off of it. But some people do. They get very animated, like they're bucking a bronco. Well, it's like umpires in baseball. It's either yeah. a strike or a strike. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so. Uh, you said, did you work? Was it uh, dirt track racing? I did both. I started out on asphalt at Portland Speedway, the old Portland Speedway, yeah. many, many years ago. Um, when that closed up, I got into open wheel modifieds and uh, just kind of did the circuit. Really, we went from everywhere from Seattle all the way to the California border on every weekend race. I was going to ask about the old, the old Portland dirt track, because mm -hmm. that, was one of the, that was the first race that my dad ever took me to. That's awesome. On that track. Mm -hmm. And when did it close? I never... 2000, 2001, I believe, um, I think is when it finally closed. Basically what happened was Portland, um, the circle track, was the longest standing NASCAR track in history, 72 years. N nobody was even close to that. However, they got to the point where it was getting old, it was getting, it needed work. And the, the problem with the noise had started to come up. So they pulled the asphalt up, they made it a dirt track, and they were hoping that the World of Outlaws, if anybody follows that, uh, different organizations were going to come in and spend money to come to Portland. The problem was, is that once they got to that point, was everybody wanted to come to Portland because it was a great half mile racetrack. It needed to be fixed and nobody was willing to put the money up. So it just lost its lease and it went away. So 73, actually 74 years, and it was gone. So we have nothing really in Portland now. We have uh, St. Helens out in um, St. Helens, Oregon. It's a small dirt track. And Lebanon and, and then up in uh, Seattle. That's it. So, yeah. Got a couple questions. So tripod in your head? No. Nope. Tripod free? Nope. Uh, R Ralph and Johnny, actually most of those guys will have a monopod. That's what I was gonna say. But, you know, for my purposes, it would just get in the way. Um, yeah, I never really needed it personally. Also curious about the noise complaints, having living, I've lived close to the uh, Portland race lane, and I didn't have any, I mean, you knew when they're, not what nights were racing and on weekends and whatnot, but. So what are, what are the parameters of... It's a decibel limit. Yes, it, it's, it's 103 decimals. And, and, and I think probably more than anything else, it's the vibration. Honestly, really, that's, that's what, what it is. Are the neighborhoods like Kenton? Or is that where they're... Like those I've heard that that's the case, that, that Kenton and... Yeah, I, I'll tell you that I have the loudest car out there, honestly. Every week for me, it's, it's a struggle to make that limit. Um, I am at 103.2 pretty much every night of the week. Um, if you take the mufflers off my car, I'm um, at like 117. Do they have some kind of, do they measure? Do yeah. they yes, there, there's a device up in the stands um, that measures the sound. Kathy, so, at the Time Shack, I've, I've been there when a car's combined, she goes, sorry honey, you're yeah. over your limit and you gotta go to the tower. And they go to the tower and I think it's a disqualification, right? Yeah, basically they give you three qual runs and on those three qual qualification, qualification runs, you you have to get underneath that noise limit. By the third run, you better be prepared. So uh, for me, uh, I usually go out there and it's usually 105, uh, 105, and luckily by the time I make the final run, I can get to 103.2. Um, and Portland's been very generous to us uh, as long as we kind of get in that 103 limit that, that you know they're allowing us to do it. However, it's getting to the point that the 103 is going to be the shutoff, and after that, you are not going to run. Now, now what it does for us is that um, there's, there's a lot of opportunities for big NHRA to come to Portland, but we can't do that because of the noise level. And uh, you'll probably know, know more than me, Greg, but I think they have three variances a year as far two, as noise. Two, two is it two now? So. Uh, the city only allows two variances for the whole year as far as the extended noise limit. Well, we have the road course, and so, you know, that's a big draw. And so those people are going to get those. We're not going to get those. So we've missed out in the last couple of years of having a very, very big NHRA presence here in Portland because of that. So, and, and that means money. I mean, my God, you're talking 
You're talking 500 to 700 racers coming into town. They're spending money on food, you know, uh, housing, all, all that. And, and we're missing out on that a little bit. And, just, and just to like add a little bit about that, uh, I, I, through the years, for the last 10 years or so, I've lived in, in, in Canton or for a large chunk of that. And um, they had a, to kind of answer your question about Kenton and their, their orientation, they had a uh, petition that they started to lower, lower the noise level. Um, and there was, I think, I just, I follow this thing on Facebook and it was like, I think like 63 people signed it. And somebody started a counter petition to leave, leave it the way it is. And I think something like 6,000 people signed it. And most of them are in and around North Portland and the Kenner Ken neighborhood. So there's a very strong local presence that they really know. A lot of the people that grow up in Kenton, grew up in Kenton, or even the people that have moved there really don't mind it and or like it. So if you go and you kind of like investigate, you'll see that it's not one side. But it's our responsibility too to make sure that, that we learn to 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 live within those parameters, and sure. and you know that's what that's what we're trying to do it, real, really hard. Um, seems to me like the old adage of good fences make good neighbors. We just need to establish what the fence is. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I honestly I welcome each and every one of you to come on out, stop by my trailer, and um, God, I'd love to see you. So thank you, thank you very much. Yeah. My car? Yeah. So it's a long story. <laughs> <laughs> so like I said, I, I, I'd done nothing but circle track racing, and I kind of won everything that I could win. And as I saw the, the area here in Portland start to dry up, I, I'm very competitive, and so I wanted to do something. So I have a good friend, Brian Overturf, that has the, the white, white lightning car. Um, <coughs> He was drag racing and I got with him and chatted with him a little bit, but I didn't really want to drive a door car. I, okay. You know, that just didn't seem like anything I wanted to do. So I went to California, um, got on the internet and I found five race cars that I was going to buy. Um, the closest one was in um, um, basically Antioch, California. The farthest one was in Texas. So my wife and I, we jumped in my truck, my trailer, and we were going. Uh, I got to California, I found that car. Uh, the dragster, mm. and uh, I bought it. I brought it home. I didn't even know how to start it, so it sat in the garage <laughs> for <laughs> sat in the garage for a month and a half. And I finally called uh, uh, John, the guy that I bought it from, and we sat on the phone for almost a month and a half. And I was great. Yes, <laughs> pretty much, pretty much every night for two hours. And I would just sit in the car, and he would teach me to go through it. Um, I'm one of those people that I don't really think sometimes before I do. And so once I did, um, the first- Perfect for a dragster yes, driver, right? <laughs> the first time I Go. went down the track, I was pretty much ready to put it in the trailer and just get rid of it. Um, it's violence. It's, it's nothing that what it looks like on television. Um, by the end of every evening when I race this car, uh, my head is just pounding. It's, it's a solid frame. There's no suspension to it. So you feel everything that, that that car is giving you on the tires, on the frame. And it's, um, it's just, it's really, um, it's not a nice ride. Uh, <laughs> but it's the rush of that moment of taking off. Once you leave, I'm not, I'm not kidding you, the, the first year that I drove this car, I didn't really see for the first 150 feet. It would just push my eyes a little bit. But as you get used to it, then you understand what it's going to do what, for you. What kind of Gs are you talking about? You know, honestly, I don't know. I, I know the big guys. I think, what are they, Greg? They're like three to five um, on the takeoff. Um, at Portland, like I said, I don't pull the chute. Uh, at Woodburn, any other place I do, the, the, the quarter mile, I do pull the chute. That's another experience that... Um, yeah, you told me about that. You get thrown no, forward. Yeah, nobody ever tells you about that. Um, <laughs> the first time you pull it, it just takes your body and slams it forward. But all your safety equipment, you know, I have a Hans device, everything is hooked to my helmet, so it just kind of pushes you forward. But you don't really realize how much you're going forward until you want to stop. So. Now, am I wrong? Top fuel 
that they have to rebuild the engines on every run? Yes, those, those guys do. And uh, top fuel and even top alcohol, they'll pretty much go through the rings and they'll go through the bearings of all the engines. The, the things that we race. Um, yeah, it's not as not Yeah, as pretty hard, much but. for me, I, I have like about 12 hours a week um, of maintenance that I need to do to make the car turn around. And it's just really adjusting the valves, changing the oil. I run alcohol, so, you know, after every run, uh, my, alcohol, my, my oil has to be changed. But other than that, for us, it's a little bit more simpler than those guys. Yeah, so. those seem confident. you got teams yeah. of support yeah. guys. Yeah. Can you tell us, or is it secret? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, it's funny that you said that because every other vehicle that I've ever owned, uh, race-wise, and uh, it's like about 25 now, um, <laughs> they've all had a name. This one I never named uh, I, because I was very unsure whether I was going to continue to do it. Um, but I've had this car for five years, and uh, Bill's a good name. Yeah, yeah, it is. <laughs> <laughs> um, Getting ready to make a change. Uh, my, my ultimate dream in life is to do top fuel drag boat racing. That's my ultimate dream. Um, that's probably going to come to fruition here, hopefully within the next year. And so then we'll, we'll see from that point forward. But no, this is the only car I didn't name. Yeah. Any other questions? Well, again, thank you so much for coming on out tonight and listening and uh, go out to the races. It's a lot of fun. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Oh, hang on. Special announcement, I guess. Yeah. So I don't. Okay. All right, guys. Uh, thanks so much for coming. Uh, we return on uh, September 20th with uh, Meadow Anderson, former AAAS Science and Technology Fellow at the US EPA, with her talk, How to Think About Climate Change Without Scaring Yourself Silly. <clears throat> The global scale of climate change and the dire predictions of its impacts can be daunting. Meadow will share her favorite resources for understanding the current situation and ways she's found to be curious about the questions that climate change is asking of us. She'll also share some of the most hopeful responses she's discovered and what she's learned about effective ways we can act to shape our shared future. This is going to be a good one. Uh, please come out for it and uh, let's have another round of applause for William Anderson. Thank you. And take a moment uh, to check out the photos in the back as well and uh, ask any questions. I'm sure there's more beers in there and contact sheets. Cheers. Thanks, everyone. Thanks.